is um, to talk for about an hour. I have a lot I want to get in today, and then we're going to do a, a satsang uh, again uh, with uh, some a little bit more specific instructions on what I'd like you to share. And I'd like as many as possible to to uh, come to the mic and share. Um, we won't be giving long talks, and uh, it's not a and a although I may very well react to what is uh, being said. Um, so the first order of business for me is to um, do something that I think will be uh, very, very helpful to you uh, in terms of um, knowing how to access uh, this... Uh, this divine guidance for whatever it is that you would like to uh, accomplish or fulfill in your life. Um, after my talk in Ephesus on, on Rumi, and, uh, and Rumi mentions Mary in several of his poems, uh, so I'll be looking at those tonight. Um, on uh, at the last talk, we're going to do uh, uh, the I Am Wishes Fulfilled Meditation. I will explain it. We're going to do a group meditation for possibly 40 minutes. Um, I do it for 80 minutes a day. Um, that may be too long for some of you, but um, and if it is, um, I may shorten it to 20. But it's uh, it's a very very powerful meditation, and you'll be hearing the the sounds uh, that uh, the sound engineers people, the the technical people, tell me are the sounds of. of of God speaking to Moses. Um, and I'll explain to you and talk to you about how to put that into practice and how to use it and, and do it. So be prepared in that last one to, to do a meditation and to be in a, in a peaceful state. Some of you may fly out of here. It's an amazing, amazing meditation. Um, and in that last uh, presentation, I will also be presenting the... Uh, the foundations for wishes fulfilled, how it came about, and what those are, and then we'll do the meditation. So that's kind of the <clears throat> plan for the rest of it. But for this morning, or the, no, it's this afternoon. I would like to, uh, I'd like to speak to you about. Um, it's, it's like the question becomes often is, um, how do I access the divine guidance uh, in order to be able to fulfill my wishes? be able to attract into my life, do, whether you call it God or whether you call it angels or whether you call it you know, divine beings, uh, um, I just know that they're there. Um, I think the, the, the <clears throat> one of the most difficult things for people to understand is this concept of, uh, of oneness. Um, Carl Jung once said that at the same moment that you're a protagonist in your own life, and you're making choices, at the very same moment you're also the spear carrier or the extra in a much larger drama. So, and then he concluded that observation with, all of you are doomed to make choices. <laughs> that is, the choices that you're making have already been made, in a sense. And, um, <clears throat> and so we have this thing that we call a free will, but at the same moment, we're operating within a larger context of everything is all perfect and handled, and there's only one. And so when we talk about the past and we talk about the future, we really understand that everything that ever happened to you in your entire life did not happen in the past. It happened in the present. It happened now, in the present moment. That's all there ever is. And everything that's going to happen to you in the future isn't going to happen in a future moment. It's going to happen in the now. So basically, your relationship to life and to your higher self is really your relationship to now, to the present moment. How good are you at uh, being in this moment? And again, <clears throat> the best analogy that I can always give is what happens to you in your dream state for one-third of your life when you are able to be in the past and the future and all of it just melds into this particular now and you can flip in and out of it as much as you want and in, even in past life regression work what, uh, what I've talked with uh, with Brian Weiss and, uh, and Mira um, is this whole um, 
this whole awareness that uh, it's really not it's really not a past life thing it's really simultaneity of life and uh, in your dream state like when we're in Athens this week you'll be uh, sitting on the same steps that Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and uh, all of the, and all of the great and Diogenes and so on all the great people from Greece uh, the great philosophers and so on and there you you <clears throat> you get an awareness that uh, they're right there, that the same atoms that they were breathing in and taking in are, the, are still there, and, and you're taking them in as well, as I spoke about in the first session, about dust, about this quiet dust. So um, one of the, the, the struggles that we have in understanding what I'm going to be speaking about here today is the... Um, the fact that we're trying to understand non-linearity in a linear body. And we're trying to understand, um, we're trying to figure something out. Uh, we're trying to understand oneness from a point of two-ness. Because every moment of your life is this incredible paradox. You are at the same moment that you are this physical body that begins and ends and that you have all of the stuff that you've accumulated and all the things of your ego that I spoke about earlier. Um, but at the very same moment, instantaneously at all times, you are also this invisibleness, this formlessness that is within you. And so you are form and non-form at all moments. The closest we can get to understanding oneness is in... Um, in meditation. That's why meditation and, and silence is such an important part of the spiritual path. You know, Melville said, um, God's one and only voice is silence. And in writing Moby Dick, he had these words. He said, For as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all of the horrors of the half-lived life. The life that um, doesn't allow you to be the divinity, the divine being that you are. So I often think about um, understanding God as um, like so often what we do is we, we, we have a tendency to pray to God and in praying to God we ask God to uh, resolve our conflicts and the problem with this approach is and asking God to solve our problems for us is that if God were able to recognize your conflicts it wouldn't be God because how can that which is oneness ever understand two-ness. The minute that it looks at two-ness, it's no longer God because it only sees one. That's why in The Course in Miracles, one of the most famous lines in the Course says, you have no problems, though you think you do. That all of your problems come from this fact that you are processing the world from a place of, of two-ness. That is, um, there is, in, in order to have conflict, Remember what I said in the, in the course earlier, that a mind at war with itself remembers not eternal gentleness. And conflict requires two. It requires the person that is, it actually requires three. <laughs> the conflict, the person who feels one way, the person who feels the other way. So that every time we try to ask God to solve our problems for us, um, we're asking God to be something other than what God is. And it's why I love the prayer of St. Francis so much and why I write, wrote an entire book based upon it, uh, In Assisi. And, and St. Francis, when he was looking for peace, he didn't say, God, please give me some peace. I don't have any peace. I just have conflict wherever I go. I'm so sad. I'm depressed all the time. He didn't say that. He said, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. In other words, teach me how to be like you. And when I 
read some of my favorite Rumi observations tomorrow, you'll see that all of Rumi's efforts and all of uh, Shams of Tabriz's efforts were to, uh, to know God, to just to come to know God um, and not to um, ask God to do something for us that God couldn't possibly do. So as Jesus said, God is love, just pure love. And love doesn't allow for any conflict, doesn't allow for any problems. So I, I brought two observations with me, and I, I remember saying to someone on my radio show just a few, uh, a few weeks before I left for this, uh, this tour, um, to um, see if in the conflict that she was having in one of her relationships with someone, I don't even remember the details, I asked her to um, try to go within and, uh, and be like God. The great, um, the great Persian poet Hafiz, he said, even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Just think what a love like that can do. It lights up the whole world. That kind of a love. That kind of a love that asks, um, doesn't say what you owe me, doesn't say that I want something from you, doesn't demand a resolution of conflict. It's just, it's a love that says, I love, and Robert Frost said it so beautifully, we love the things we love for what they are. Not for what they ought to be, not for what they used to be, not for what they should do for me. We love the things we love for what they are. And I was telling this woman to try to approach the person that you're in a conflict from the place of, uh, of oneness, of just the only thing that you can be is love. That's all. That's, that's all you have available to you. And in the process of, of, of getting to that place, and this is why silence has become such, such an important uh, part of my life. And my kids will tell you, I don't even have a radio in my car. I have one, but uh, I never turn it on. Um, to me, getting in an automobile and having a 20-minute drive or whatever uh, is such a wonderful opportunity to not have something coming at me, you know. Um, and I get in the car, and of course, when they go to use the car, well, I get in and I say, "What's this? What is this? What's in my car? What is this? You know, get get rid of this." And I walk. I'll be out, uh, whatever I'm doing. I walk into the house, and there'll be all of this noise all over the house. I say, "What's going on?" And all of a sudden, all of the the, uh, the radios go off, the TV goes off. The, it's, uh, that uh, that joy of silence, because that's the joy of God. It's um, I one time had to do uh, a, uh, an interview with um, <laughs> a group of people, um, uh, singers. Um, they called one day and they wanted to know if, uh, they called my secretary, Maya. Um, the guy's name was Flea. And uh, he called Maya and uh, she thought that I, they wanted me to do a, uh, a speaking engagement for a restaurant um, that was called Chili Peppers. <laughs> and and there's some, some flea or flea or something, she said, I just don't understand this call at all. You know? <laughs> but then again, Maya doesn't always get everything right. I mean, I remember when she found out about the uh, uh, I was telling her about the, the, Dead sea, the Dead Sea Scrolls and that there were these, you know, these scrolls that have just been discovered that uh, talk about you know, the information before Constantine, the Emperor Constantine, changed the whole Bible around you know, according to how he wanted it to be. And she said, what are the Dead Sea Squirrels? She said, I don't understand Dead Sea Squirrels. And I said, oh yes, these little creatures, you know, and they're all... <laughs> So, that's my Maya. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I got this call from the uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. And uh, 
they wanted, um, these were four guys who had been very serious drug addicts, heroin addicts, and uh, they um, all got clean. And they got clean because they were, uh, according to Flea, uh, who was one of the singers in this group, who um, uh, they had read uh, some of my work, you'll see it when you believe it particular, and had just decided that they were going to get drug free. And they invited me to come to a concert of theirs and, and to talk to each one of them. And, and then this a TV show on v, VH1, I think it's called, are do, we're doing a, a series called Behind the Music. And they could pick anybody they wanted to interview each one of the four uh, people, and they asked me to do that. And in the process of doing that, they invited me to come out to California and to go to one of their concerts. And uh, I honestly had, didn't know anything about them. Uh, but I agreed to do it. And my kids were just, this is when I became a little a little more respectful in their eyes. <laughs> they were getting free concert tickets forever to any Red Hot Chili Peppers uh, concert. Anytime, every place they get to go and and they, we went backstage with them and talked to them and they, they put me in front of a speaker that was about as big as this room and screamed and danced and jumped and hollered and screamed and my daughter came up to me afterwards she said dad they were singing about you they used your name in the talk could you hear them they said your actual name in the song I said I have no idea about one word that came out of them all I could do is well, when can I get out of this place when can I it was the, I was just shaking with the noise and this <laughs> hmm. At any rate, uh, I interviewed each one of them, and it's a, it's a special. You can find this thing. It's on YouTube, uh, the, the various interviews that I did with the uh, four Red Hot Chili Peppers. Um, and I think Anthony Cadillas, Cadillas, what? Anthony Kiedis. I mean, Serena fell in love with this guy. And, uh, um, and when I was interviewing the... Um, the um, People who were composing the music. One of the one of the one of the guys is a his father is a judge in in Florida. Francione, I think, is his last name. He's a judge, and he um, he was talking to me about uh, how um, music is created, and he said well, the most important thing to remember when you're writing music is that it all comes out of the silence. And the silence is a more important part of the music than the notes. So that it's, this, it's the space between the notes. It's the space between the notes that creates the music. And without the space between the notes, there is no music. Because with no space, all you have is... Uh, you need a pause. And, and out of that pause comes the next note and comes the next note and Zen they say it's the, it's, the, it's the space between the bars that holds the tiger and it's the silence between the notes that makes the music so this idea of the silence and if you want to come to know God and remember a big part of this entire uh, seminar whatever this is at sea that we're doing uh, a big part of this is uh, an awareness that God is not something external to you. Um, that we are all individualized expressions of the divine mind. That we are all God. There is no place that God is not. We must be like what we from. I don't have to review all of this. That is, that's a really important part of it. So you're not looking for something outside of you. You're trying to connect to the highest place within you, which is a place of silence. And so in order to be able to resolve disputes and conflicts and difficulties that you have, you can't ask something that is oneness to come in and solve something called two-ness because the moment that it did, it wouldn't be oneness. So God is just, you're, you're just wasting your energy and you're wasting your time. And that's why St. Francis said, where there is hatred, let me bring love. Let me, let me be love. Where there is darkness, light where there is sadness, joy. Um, let me be these things rather than, you know, it, trying to, uh, you know, 
trying to take hatred out to say, okay, here's hatred, let's take it out of the room and let's bring in some love. That's not, that's not how God is. That's not how the highest self is. The, God, the highest self looks at hatred and says, I am going to make this love. I'm going to bring love to this. So I, I brought two observations. Oh, one of them is from... Uh, Is from Saint Germain. This is a, a really a divine book. This is a, it's a book called The Unveiled Mysteries. Anybody read this? Anybody read The Unveiled Mysteries? Maybe one, two. What'd you think of it? Did you get it? Those people who raised their hand, yeah. Okay, I, I guess I should have had a mic on, because especially since we're recording it. It does. It feels like a story. When you're reading it, it's not a story. It's not, it's not non-fiction. I mean, it's not fiction. Excuse me. It's not this, this is, it's an experience, and it's like it's an aw a awareness that you can move in and out of dimensions of reality, um, and you can actually leave your body at the side, just like you do when you dream, only you can... You literally can get to a place when you get to the fifth dimension where there is no form, no beginnings, no ends, no cause, no effect. They're just what you have every night in your dream. You can do this at any time in your life and enter into other levels of consciousness in which... Uh, um, and it's, it's, it's only available for a handful who are willing to do the work. And I've been willing to do the work lately. <laughs> So, I'm going to quote from St. Germain, and I'm also going to quote from Lao Tzu. And they both basically say the same thing. The attitude of one who wishes to work in conscious cooperation with the ascended host should not be, I wish I could go to them for instruction, but rather, I will so purify, discipline, and perfect myself, I will become such an expression of divine love, wisdom, and power that I can assist in their work. Then I will automatically be drawn unto them. I will love so constantly, so infinitely, so divinely, that the very intensity of my own light will open the way for them to accept me. Basically, what that message is saying is that divine guidance, God, the Tao, is not going to come to you unless you are so much like them that they will recognize themselves in you and provide you with whatever it is that you seek. Does that make sense? I'm going to have to say it again because I see some people going, what does he mean? If you want to access divine light, God, higher consciousness, divine mind, angels, um, ascended beings, ascended hosts, and so on. And I've said to you many times here that I know I've been in this training but somehow from the time I was a little boy, uh, up all the way through school and through the service and through college and as a professor and, ex and leaving professorships and as a writer and as a speaker and all of that, that it's all been a journey to teach me how to be more like them. And them is divine love. And divine love <clears throat> is a love that never varies and never changes. It's always there. Here's how Patanjali defined divine love. When you are steadfast, steadfast means you never slip. It means it's all you have to give away. When you are steadfast in your abstention of thoughts of harm directed towards yourself and others, that all living creatures will cease to feel fear in your presence. When you're steadfast. 
this is what the saints are like. This is who Jesus was. This is who Muhammad was. More and more, as I travel throughout this um, Muslim world and um, have engaged myself in the, in the poetry and the teachings of this, uh, I realize what an incredibly beautiful religion this is. <laughs> And how for people to be judging the Muslim world on the basis of some people at the far extremes would be the same thing to assume that Christianity is defined by the behavior of the KKK, who claim to be Christians and yet lynch people. It's, it's like we realize this is fringe stuff, but the essence of this Muslim religion is nothing but just pure divine love. And... In the Quran, in the Quran, Jesus is mentioned more frequently than Muhammad in the Quran. And Rumi's poetry is filled with references to Mary and Moses and Jesus and Buddha. It's, um, it's an all inclusive, beautiful, loving, peaceful, glorious religion that fringes of done things to create a conflict amongst us on the planet when we're basically all one. I heard a speaker recently, I think it was Greg Braden, speaking and saying that uh, he had talked to a person who had had one of these powerful NDEs and in this near-death experience they had talked to God and, and finally asked the question to God, which one of the religions that is here on the planet is being practiced do you prefer? <laughs> and he said, I just don't care. <laughs> I just don't care. It's like I can't even be bothered with all of that. You know. So in order for you to access divine guidance, and I have seen this happen for myself in my own life, I'm going to share that with you shortly, um, you must rid yourself of all judgment condemnation, criticism of any of God's children toward any of God's children and become like Hafiz said to be in that place which lights up the whole world that you have love for everything and everyone even that which seems to be so offensive to your sensibilities and what you've been taught and what you've been encouraged to believe and so on that all you have to give away is love because that's what's inside which is what's inside my brother just wrote to me today this beautiful um, letter that he wrote he, he, he's, a, he's a veteran and he, was, uh, he came very close to being killed in Vietnam and uh, he now has Parkinson's disease as a result of um, the Agent Orange exposure to and uh, and, um, and he was just a mess because of the experiences that he had. He was a medic over there in, in Vietnam and there was one day when they brought in 200 bodies, you know, um, of young kids, 18 and 19 years old. They're just, you know, putting them in balance. It's just, and we've, we've seen now, the, the Time magazine just recently had a cover story um, it's called One Every Day. And they said that one soldier every day on active duty commits suicide. One a day. Every day. The one on active duty in Afghanistan. Because it seems to me that they're, they're placed into this um, the place where there's such a paradox that they have to live, that they're being told to kill their brothers. You know, handed and told that there's this whole concept of the insanity and the fog of war is such a, um, a dominant force in our, in, in our world, in our society. And it's like going back, you know, no, no, when I read about what was happening in the 12th century at the, t at the time of Rumi, or when I read it at what was happening in, in the 5th century before Christ, you know, when I read about what was happening in, at the time of Moses, the, 800 years before that. It's still, it's just all about these conflicts. It's about identifying who we are on the basis of our senses and our labels and what we've been told and our cultures and so on. 
Um, and we need to create a, a world. And having this number of people and people watching this uh, um, get to a place where we recognize that in order for us to resolve the uh, conflicts that exist on our planet, we have to we have to go to a place of divine love. That's our. Uh, that's almost our. Our instructions. So that's what Saint Germain said, and I'm, I'm going to just share the salient part of that one more time, so, um, so that it really registers with you. The attitude of one who wishes to work in conscious cooperation with the Ascended Host, if you want to heal yourself, if you want to attract abundance into your life, if you want to have a divine relationship, if you want to, to get the job that you want, if you want to have a, a great family, if, or whatever it is that you want to have in your life. The attitude of one who wishes to work in conscious cooperation with the Ascended Host should not be, I wish I could go to them for instruction. You are wasting your time. If you're wallowing around in condemnation, judgment, and criticism towards any of God's children, they will never recognize you because they can only see who they are in those people that they are attempting to, uh, to work with. And if they don't see themselves in you, you will be ignored. <clears throat> The attitude should be, I will so purify, discipline, and perfect myself and become such an expression of divine love, wisdom, and power that I can assist in their work, then I will automatically be drawn unto them. I will love so constantly, so infinitely, so divinely, that the very intensity of my own light will open the way for them to accept me. I, I mean, I take that as a very serious uh, um, direction to practice love everywhere, to give it at all times. And, and it's happened for me just recently. I think I've been sort of on that fringe of that. I've certainly had plenty of judgment and plenty of criticism and plenty of condemnation in my life as I'm growing up. But it's, um, it's pretty much non-existent anymore. Um, I mean, I have people that I would rather vote for and things like this, but um, I see love. On my puja table, at my, at my sacred place, is a picture of a guy who's on the radio every day saying things that are in violation of everything that I hold to be dear in my heart. His name is Rush Limbaugh. And I have his picture because this is what Ramdas taught me back during the war in the Civil, in the, uh, civil War, <laughs> uh, the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, he had to take a um, picture of Caspar Weinberger, <laughs> who was the Secretary of Defense, who was, uh, uh, and, and put him on his table. To, and his teacher told him, and Neem Karoli Baba told him, take those people that you have the most internal animosity toward and put them on your, in your sacred spot and send love to them. Not, I mean, this was the message of all of our spiritual teachers. You know? When you are steadfast and your abstent harm directed towards yourself and others, that all living creatures, even children and animals, will want to be around you and close to you. Kindness toward all. You can't call yourself a kind person if you're nasty to the person who comes in and cleans your toilets or takes your bags at the airport or drives you in your cab. Love for all, infinite love. That's what divine love is. And then I got my friend Reed to uh, go on his internet and uh, pull up this. Um, it's from the book The Shift. And this, <clears throat> this is what Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu said to this in the Tao Te Ching. <clears throat> The mystical techniques 
for achieving immortality <clears throat> are revealed only to those who have dissolved all ties to the gross worldly realm of duality, conflict, and dogma. As long as your shallow worldly ambitions exist, the door will not open. When you succeed in connecting your energy with the divine realm through high awareness and the practice of undiscriminating virtue, that transmission of the ultimate subtle truths will follow. That's very powerful words. <laughs> Once again, the mystical techniques for achieving immortality are revealed only to those who have dissolved all ties to the gross worldly realm of duality, conflict, and dogma. As long as your shallow worldly ambitions exist, the door will not open. You can't get that door open if the divine beings who are pure love, the transcendent beings, the ascended masters, the Saint Germains, the Jesuses, the all, the, all of them, all of the ascended, all, all of those who are in living in God consciousness, God realization, they have to recognize themselves in you in order for them to be able to guide you. If you are coming from hatred, anger, bitterness, t you know, t tension, revenge, hatred, if you're coming from that in any way in your heart, the door just simply will not be opened. Nobody, it's not like you're going to get punished and you're going to get hit over the head and think bad things are going to happen to you. It's that <clears throat> you cannot access this divine guidance, this assistance from this realm because they can't recognize you. And that's why the only way you can ever come to know God and make conscious contact with God is when you are in silence and allowing yourself to be... There was a great t teacher in, 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 uh, in India. Uh, his name was Vivekananda. Vivekananda came to this country in the early part of the 20th century, a divine spiritual master. He was a great teacher of Paramahansa Yogananda, uh, Sri Yukteswar, um, so many of the great uh, teachers uh, of the 20th century, Sai Baba, um, Muktananda. Uh, Vivekananda was this brilliant man who came to the West. And they, he was always asked the question, um, how do I, uh, how, how do I get to this place where I can um, access this divine, how do I fill myself with this kind of love in, in, in such a world? How can I do this when I'm encountering the opposite so frequently? You know, they used to say of Jesus that when he would go into a, uh, into a village, just his presence in the village and nothing more would elevate the consciousness of the entire village. There are people that you know, when they walk into the room, the energy of the room changes. I, I, I knew that with uh, Mother Teresa. Seeing her in the room in Phoenix, Arizona, I watched the energy of the room change when she walked in there. And I like to think that that's something that uh, as I get better and better at this divine love, this absence of judgment, criticism, condemnation, uh, that you, you, I can really change the, you can change it through silence. I spend much more time in silence, even in, converse, even in places where there's conversation going on, knowing that if I just can send a kind of acceptance and a kind of love, even where I'm hearing things that I don't, particularly agree with, with my ego doesn't agree with, that I can, I can absolutely help make that shift. And Vivekananda was asked that question and this is what he said. He said, in the springtime, go out and observe the blossoms on the fruit trees. He said, the blossoms vanish as the fruit grows. So too will the lower self the ego, vanish as the divine grows within you. This isn't about reaching in and taking all of the crap out. <laughs> it's about 
filling your inner world with so much love and so much acceptance and kindness and joy and peace and love towards everything and everyone, being able to do that, that it forces out the lower self, the ego, which is based upon I am what I have, I am what I do, I am my reputation, I am what I own. <laughs> I am separate from everyone else, I'm in conflict with everyone else, I must win, I have to compete, and I'm separate from God. That's the ego. And that stuff just starts to go out as the divine grows within you and you see the unfolding of God in everything and everyone. So, one more time. The mystical techniques for achieving immortality are revealed only to those who have dissolved all ties to the gross worldly realm of duality, conflict, and dogma. And as long as your shallow worldly ambitions exist, the door just won't open. When you succeed in connecting your energy with the divine realm through higher awareness and the practice of undiscriminating virtue, the transmission of the ultimate subtle truths will follow. They'll follow. So, about two years ago I received this uh, notice from the uh, medical team that I um, have uh, been diagnosed with leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And um, my um, my initial reaction to that was, uh, was shock, that I don't do leukemia. Other people do that. That isn't something that I do. Um, now, what I have learned, especially in the last two years, is that um, almost everything that we come to think of as our truths come from um, our, our over-identification with the physical world, with the material world, with what our senses tell us and what we see on paper and what the numbers tell us and, and uh, what the doctors tell us and, and so on and, uh, and virtually everything else. And one of the things that you have to learn as I studied the I Am Discourses and the works of St. Germain and, uh, and Rumi and so many others is you... Um, is that you have to ign ignore even what your senses tell you. And I'll be speaking about this the day after tomorrow, or this, the talk after tomorrow, whenever that is, next week, this coming week. Um, that we have to really take and, uh, and recognize that uh, we have an I am presence, and this I am presence is so powerful. And it's, um, it's really who we are. And all the rest of this, that's why I started all of this off with, we're not these bodies, and Lao Tzu said, you're not doing anything, you're just being done. We're all just being done, you know? And it's like, you know that when you look at your body. <laughs> you watch it and you know it's just, you know it's on its way out of here. It's like, it's like life itself is a sexually transmitted terminal disease. I mean, we know that, you know, it's just, uh, um, and, we, and we get that, and we, we know that about ourselves, and we can try to alter it and change it, but none of that. Um, so it's, it's really getting to this uh, place where you start making your, uh, your, virtually all of your assessments about who you are and what you're capable of, what's possible for you, and so on. You start making it on the basis of, uh, of an internal uh, commitment to your identification, not with the physical world at all but with your I am presence, the presence of God within yourself, your I am presence. It's such an important part of, of, uh, of this new consciousness. So when I got this diagnosis of, uh, of leukemia, um, I, uh, I didn't physically say, oh my God, this is terrible, I'm, my body's gonna, I'm gonna die. That's not a big surprise. <laughs> um, and whether it's now or whether it's 20 years from now or 30 years from now or a week from now, whatever, it's like, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's just a speck in infinity. I mean, I know I'm a parenthesis in eternity. I mean, I know that. I know that. Uh, and so, and we all do. But there was a, the, the, my over-identification with my ego and my body and this is who I really am and I am my work and, and I've done all of these things and that's not fair and, and all of that stuff. Um, 
subconsciously, I just went to um, a place internally called fear. And as I said, the Course says there's e every, it's either fear or love. And everything that is fear can't be love. Everything that's love can't be fear. So it's like, how do you get rid of the fear? Even if it's subconscious fear, how do you get rid of that? Oh my God, you know, I'm, I'm being told things that um, you have to slow down and you, you, uh, you can't overexert and you can't, um, you, you can't have heat, too much heat and, and you have to rest more and uh, you're going to have night sweats and uh, you're, um, it's, uh, you're going to get more fatigued and it's like, it's like this whole pile of stuff that just gets thrown at you and then people send you information about someone who just died of what you have, you know, which is always wonderful, you know. So, uh, so, um, so I had like a perfect storm happen to me. Oh my goodness. We'll go a little over today. I hope it's okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't know how much longer, how long we can stay in here, but we'll probably do a little bit over. Um, unless they kick us out, if there's something going on. And there might be. It's a big ship, a lot of people. We'll respect that. Um, <clears throat> So, um, I had this perfect storm. And the perfect storm is when just all of these things seem to come together and coalesce like perfectly, right? And I, I received a letter from uh, this woman, her name is Mira Kelly, and <clears throat> she heard that I had leukemia because C uh, CB uh, CBS News did a whole big story on it right around Thanksgiving time, so it was broadcast all over the world. and then. Of course, there's this thing called the internet that, you know, you know, if you masturbate, the world knows about it, all right? I mean, there's a camera somewhere in there, you know, so, so. Um, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so it's like, you type my name in on, on, on the internet, on Google, and like a half million things come up. Seriously, four and a half million things about me on there. See, I don't, I don't, I can't imagine four and a half million things about me being out there. I, I can hardly remember, you know, what I had for breakfast, and there's four and a half million things about me. Anyway, so um, anyway, she heard about this, and she wrote me a letter, and she came to Maui, and she did a past life regression with me, and she also brought me something off the internet uh, from, about a near-death experience of a woman named Anita M. So all of this stuff happened at one time. I'm really rushing through this now. So um, uh, I came, she came, she did this past life regression with me, which was, and I write all about this in Wishes Fulfilled, it's in the last chapter of it. And I go back into this, uh, like back, I don't know about back, because there's no forward, there's no back, but I go into this, this new realm. And, uh, and I'm this old man, and I'm uh, uh, in a cave, and there's this light, and it's so intense. I can tell you what I was wearing. I can tell you everything about it as if, it, uh, as if I'm reliving this thing. And I've got a son, and my son is uh, uh, he's filled with anger and hate because he wants to get revenge on something that happened to his mother, my wife. And, um, and I'm trying to get him to step into the light and to see that if you just get into this light, this light is just pure love, and I'm, I'm screaming and begging. She recorded this whole thing. I mean, it's a, uh, him to just see the light, just step into the light. In the light, there's none of this. You don't have to have that. It's all, and he won't. And so I remember what the picture is like, and then she, her mother, is, she's from Bulgaria, and her mother's from Bulgaria, and she sends me a, a picture a few months later of uh, a man in Bulgaria whose name is Peter Dunov. Um, Peter Dunoff is this giant spiritual master um, who was born in 1864, died in 1944 when I was four years of age. And he was teaching something called divine love. And Albert Einstein, the great Albert Einstein, said, the whole world bows before me. This is when he came out with his theory of relativity and so on. He said, the whole world bows before me and I bow before Peter Dunov, the master Peter Dunov. Um, D-E-U-N-O-V, Peter Dunov, you might want to check him out. Um, and he speaks about divine love. So she sent me this picture of Peter Dunov, um, and, I, and, and on the, it's a big book like this with all kinds of pictures of his life and so on. And, uh, and I look at this picture, 
And that's who I was in this regression. I mean, it was, it was exactly, as soon as I looked at it, I, I went back and I, my knees got weak and I realized, and he was alive for four years of my life. So it's, this, this is simultaneity. This, that doesn't, somebody doesn't have to be dead in order to be, in fact, you know, it's a little strange. We could go there. I'd, I'd love to talk about this, but it's like you, you can... Be any, you can be in anybody's life at any time, just like in your dream state. Uh, it doesn't require a linear thing. Somebody doesn't have to die in order for somebody to come back in incarnation and so on. It's all one, folks. It's all one. It's all one. Then, tomorrow, all now. It's all now. Hard to get because you're trying to process this with something that did begin and does end. Parenthesis, that's just eternity. This little parenthesis. Eternity is always. Okay? So, Peter Dunoff becomes this... And as I look at, at read Rumi, and, and, and Peter Dunoff was talking about the panurythmia, the, he did a lot of the dervish kinds of things and the walking. And, and when Peter Dun when when the Nazis came into Bulgaria, uh, and occupied them. Uh, there were 48,000 Jews in Bulgaria. And the Tsar of Bulgaria at that time in 1943 uh, was in hiding. And um, he was the uh, only one who could stop the deportation of 48,000 Jews who were being sent to Auschwitz. They were getting ready to be boarded on trains to be sent to Auschwitz. And Someone came to Peter Dunoff and told him this. This was in 1943, the year before he died, a few months before he died. He left because he just because the Nazis were looking for him because they were so offended and threatened by what he taught. And they ask Peter Dunoff, "Where is the Tsar? If he gives the if he gives the instruction not to send them, they won't be sent. But no one can find him because he's in hiding." And he closed his eyes, and he named a city. I don't know what the city was. There's some people from Bulgaria here, they may know. Um, I just read this uh, not too long ago, and Mira has told me about this. And he named the city, and they went to that city, and there was the Tsar hiding in that city, and he gave the order. And the 48,000 people, there wasn't one Jew sent to one concentration camp from the country of Bulgaria for the whole time of the, of the occupation uh, because of Peter Dunov. This is the consciousness that I'm speaking about, okay? So, in this past life regression, that happened to me, and then she brought me this information about this woman named Peter, about this uh, woman named Anita M., who I looked up and found, found her. Then she was from Hong Kong. She happened to be in Dubai uh, giving a talk that day. It was on her birthday, and I asked the people at Hay House to contact her. I want, to, I want her story. Uh, her story is, is, is written in a book called um, Dying to Be Me. And this is a woman who had, uh, was down to 82 pounds, who had had five years of lymphoma. Um, she was, her la this was, these were her last hours. Her organs had all shut down and she was um, departing. And she was watching as they wheeled her into, a, uh, <clears throat> into the emergency room in Hong Kong. She was watching the whole thing from above and, uh, and saw herself given the option of coming back or not. And, uh, and she did. And she, uh, within four days, 60% of her tumors had been shrunk. And within four weeks, she was cancer-free. They couldn't even find a place to get an autopsy or to get a biopsy. Um, for her cancer. And today she's cancer-free. I just spoke with her in London and in Scotland. I wrote the foreword to her book. I really encourage you to read it. In fact, true story, last night I got a message on my phone that Ellen DeGeneres uh, wants to talk to me. Uh, and you, many of you may know that I uh, married Ellen and po Portia de Rossi. Uh, they asked me to officiate at their wedding. and So... Um, so I called Ellen last night, and I talked to her for about a half an hour, and she said, my mom fell, uh, and she broke her back. Uh, she's 82 years old, and she's, she said, the only person that she will talk to and, and listen to is you. 
and would you call her? So I talked to her mom, Betty, for close to an hour last night. Uh, I got to remember to send a bill for that. That was on my f my little no, phone. Um, and um, I gave her the whole I am the whole I am thing and so on. So it's um, <clears throat> this um, th th this ability to heal ourselves, and by the way, she read Dying to Be Me, that's what I wanted to say. Um, Ellen not only read it, but her mother had read it. And her mother told me, she said, it gave me a completely, totally different outlook on the ending of life as we know it. Um, and she was just totally at peace with it. And she even said after we talked for a half an hour, I feel so much better already. <laughs> and I said, you're, you're on your way to healing. So. Um, The third part of this uh, perfect storm, other than Mira and Anita, um, was John of God. And a woman, um, a doctor, a medical doctor named Raina uh, Piskova, who's an eye surgeon, was going down to Abhijanya in Brazil. And she was going to um, see, visit with John of God because she had been there a few years back. You know, John of God is this person who has done this kind of healing. He doesn't do it himself. He has these entities enter into his body and they do this healing. And, and some of you may think this is weird and strange and if you're watching, it is. Um, Oprah did an entire show on it. And uh, in fact, I was talking to Oprah about it on the show I just did with her recently. And the day after we finished that interview, or two days after that, she flew down there herself. To, uh, to experience this, but she had sent a crew down there and, uh, um, and nobody can explain what is going on here with these entities that enter in and do this uh, incredible kind of healing to over 40 million people. He is working, he could take a room like this with say four or five hundred people in it and do a, um, when these entities enter in and go through every single person in this room in one second. <laughs> and so, it's uh, you have to have a mind that's open to everything and attached to nothing to uh, to understand this. But this was a ch turning point in my life, um, and I didn't go down to Abhijanya because I was writing and I just didn't want to stop my writing. Uh, and so she went anyway, uh, and she called me when she got down there and said, "If you will have a picture taken of yourself dressed in white." from the front and from the back, and from the side and from the side, take all four. And if you will take these herbs, and if you will drink this blessed water, and if you will follow the instructions, John of God will do a, uh, um, he'll have the entities visit you. I was in Maui, uh, John of God was in Brazil, seven hour time difference. Um, and who am I to say no to that? Uh, it was a wonderful opportunity. I just love this Raina uh, Peskova lady, m medical doctor, because she just was obsessed with um, my needing to uh, have this experience for this healing. Um, to make this a, a much shorter, um, I <clears throat> it was a Thursday night. He did the he did the uh, he told me to go to sleep at this particular time. When you go to bed at night, wear white. Um, have the water, take the herbs. She had the herbs FedExed up to me so that I would have them. So that, because uh, the first time he said no, uh, until I'm taking the herbs, then I took the herbs, sent it again the following week, and he agreed to do it. I went to bed. Serena, come on up here, honey. Um, and um, she, uh, the, uh, I woke up the next uh, morning after the. Uh, just, you can sit here, baby. So, um, she told me, they, they told me, when she called me, she said, now you've had surgery. And um, you have to sleep for the next 24 hours. This was now at 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. And I said, Raina, I'm, I'm not tired. I can't go back and sleep for 24 hours. Uh, she said, y you must do this. And you must follow, it's, it's no different than if you've had your spleen taken out. She said, it's that kind of surgery. And I said, okay. Um, but I, when I hung up, I said, I'm going, I'm, walk. I'm going for my walk in the morning. I'm going to do that. I just, it was. So I went for a walk and I got about uh, 200 yards. And um, 
I collapsed. I could hardly get back into my home. And I just kind of walked in. Serena was there, my son Sands was there, and they helped me get back into bed, and I slept for 24 hours. And for the next week, I was um, practically immobilized. I, they brought me a little bit of soup. Uh, I, I couldn't eat. Uh, I just was... Because I, I swim every day, and I do yoga, and, and uh, actually I'd given up yoga after I had the diagnosis of leukemia. I just gave it up because they told me I couldn't do that, and a something bought inside of me bought into that. Um, so they said, the following Thursday, um, you will have the sutures removed. I know. <laughs> That's what Oprah said, too. The what? There's no... <laughs> Uh, there are no sutures, but that's what they call it. They're spiritual sutures, okay? So, uh, again, I was... Uh, I knew how sick I had been for the previous week and how weak I had been and how unable to do practically anything. Uh, but um, I still had some whole questions about sutures being taken out in the middle of the night. And then she warned me. She said, when this happened to her, she said it was like a... a, a there was an earthquake in the room. She said, if you have things on high shelves, she said, take it off because the room is going to take. She said, these entities will enter into your room and they will be there and they will be working on you. <laughs> and I said, okay. And I wore white and I put the water in there and I went to bed. They were, my kids said, what, you know, the ghosts are going to come in. They were giving me crap about this for sure. Uh, <laughs> and... Um, so I went to sleep uh, that night, and uh, I came out in the morning, and it was uh, uh, my my. Uh, I, I called this friend of mine. Her name is Carrie. She was getting on a flight. She was flying over to Honolulu, and and she said, "So how did it go last night? How did it go?" I said, "Well, it's uh, it's you know, it's eight o'clock or whatever. Or it's, it's, no, it's only seven, seven fifteen. And she said, no, no, no. She said, it's eight o'clock. I'm getting on a plane uh, right now. I said, it's not eight o'clock. I said, I'm looking right at my watch. It's seven fifteen. She said, no, I'm telling you, it's eight o'clock. And I had just gotten this brand new watch that this one encouraged me to get. It's called a Panerai and it costs like more than my first house cost. And I didn't want to get it, but she just insisted that I get it because she really wanted my other watch. Basically, that's what it was. Uh, <laughs> But, or no, I, because I, th <laughs> I think there are other reasons for all of this. At any rate, um, I looked at my watch, and my watch, which had been guaranteed to never lose or gain a second either way, for like the next 20 years, they'll give you your money back if it doesn't work for perfectly and so on. It's one of these guaranteed, like atomic watches or something, I don't know. It was just shattered. It just, it just stopped working in the middle of the night. And it had always kept perfect. I'd only had it about a month or so, but it had kept absolute perfect time, and it was shattered. And by the way, it, I had to, it, it didn't work anymore. The next day it did the same thing. It had lost like 40 minutes or so. So um, I walked out, and I said, can you believe it, my watch? And then I, went, I asked Serena to come up so, so that she could describe to you what happened that morning. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, he came out of his room, and Sands and I were already up. And he came out, and he looked insane. Um, actually, he came out, and he was wearing these white pants, and they completely <laughs> fell off <laughs> naked right in front of me. So that was, like, a really awful experience I, I lost for my... me. <laughs> but he lost his pants, and he was, like, holding up his pants with one hand, and he was saying, I just, you're just so beautiful. I love you so much. <laughs> and my little boy, you're so beautiful. I love you guys so much. You're the best kids in the world. And we were both, like, what were you doing in there? <laughs> and his eyes were all red, and he was, like, red looking. And then I looked at him, and I said, um, you have stuff in your eyes. And he had, like, this, it looked like if you had taken a Kleenex and put some of it in your eye, he had, like, white tissue. Puss, like, in pussy his eye. stuff, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. sick. And so I had to, like, help him get it out. But anyways, he was just acting crazy, and he looked crazy. And he was just, like, kept telling us how much he loved us. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, from that moment on, I had, I believe, at this point, looking back on it, fear had been taken out of me. And um, that day, when I was getting ready to go walk, because I hadn't been to yoga now for 11 months since I'd had the diagnosis, 
Uh, I do Bikram yoga, which is hot yoga, and I was told you can't overheat yourself. And there was a literal voice. You said I didn't have any pupils, didn't you? Wasn't there? Some... Oh yeah, his eyes looked like there was no pupils. So um, I heard a voice say inside of me, you can go to yoga, you have no reason to not go to yoga anymore. And I started to go to walk, walk and, no, and it was like this internal said, no, no, you can go to yoga now. You can go back and, and, and do that. So I went to, back to yoga and then I started doing yoga four or five times a week. It was like I had lost not one minute of it. My 71st birthday was a few days later and I went out and gave away money to homeless people in San Francisco. I had flown to there to do a movie. And that's all I wanted to do. And I was just sobbing internally with just this joy of everyone that I would see, these people that no one would want to touch who had, who had looked like their clothes hadn't been washed and, and smell, had these horrible odors and, you know, dirty. And so I would wrap my arms around them and feel this incredible love for them. It was... Uh, it was like I had been infused with and what I believe that these entities did because how can you put suture, sutures on leukemia? Leukemia is, is a cancer of the blood. I mean, that's a lot of sutures. <laughs> you know, at every place that there's leukemia in you, it's in every drop of blood you have. Um, what they did is they took the, um, the fear away and they replaced it with this love and allowed me to... Uh, and they, and, and it's, it's been that way it's been now almost, it was two years, it was Grandma's 95th birthday when, when all of this take pl took place. It was April the 21st, a year ago, April the 21st. Um, and that, that expression and that feeling of love is so powerful and so overwhelming that um, I find myself having difficulty ha having hatred towards anything or anyone or judgment towards anything or anyone, such as the uh, experience of uh, of having this, and I'm, I've really shortened this at all. So now there's a, a letter here, and um, I want to read this letter to you. Um, it says, "Hello, my daughter, and I would personally like to compliment uh, Adam Savage for the wonderful job he's done to assist us in the planning of our trip on the Celebrity Cruise Line with Wayne Dyer. Adam has helped us from the beginning." Um, Due to our daughter Jennifer's medical condition, we had lots of questions. Jen first learned of the trip when she attended the May 2012 Hay House I Can Do It conference in Vancouver, British Columbia. She returned so excited by the presentations offered by Dr. Dyer uh, and, and the other speakers. Uh, this workshop came at a very important time for her. Last September, at 37 years of age, after leading a life committed to health and well-being, Jen was diagnosed with stage four esophageal cancer that had already spread to her lungs. The news was devastating to her, her family, and our family. September to December 2011, Jan used a uh, feeding tube and had uh, weekly chemo with radiation five days a week. She added holistic energy work, supplements, counseling, massage, acupuncture, and every other opportunity that was presented by her colleagues in the South Sound Healers Network. The commitment to regaining her health and her severe condition resulted in her closing her counseling practice and to discontinuing her teaching at Tacoma Community College. Jen earned her MA and uh, CHT at Bastyr University in Seattle. She was inspired to go into counseling after reading every book written by Dr. Dyer. And our whole family has watched his specials on our local PBS channel, KCTS uh, Channel 9. We thought that Jen had won her battle when the esophagus and lungs were miraculously clear in late December. We began the year with joyful hope, only to have it dashed in March when a brain tumor was discovered. Although the doctors at Virginia Mason Hospital said they felt she was terminal with 12 months to live, our family sought out new doctors at Swedish Hospital and Life Springs Cancer Center. More importantly, Jen was aggressive in meeting the challenge and had gamma knife radiation, a second round of chemo, and even went to Brazil to spend two weeks with John of God, who Dr. Dyer also sought out for his medical condition. Jen will have her 12th week of her third round of chemo tomorrow, the day before we leave. She's bringing Chinese herbs and daily injections with her as well as a positive spirit and willingness to live for her son, who's 10 years old. This trip will be a special time of healing for her as well as a time of making memories for us as a mother and daughter who are walking this journey together. 
Adam has been compassionate and caring. He listened when we started planning, not knowing if Jen would be well enough to actually take this very special trip. He guided us to make good practical decisions like buying travel insurance and was compassionate when I cried on the phone. He never seemed too busy to listen and find the answers to the questions we ask. He is outstanding and wonderful. Sincerely, Pam and Jennifer LeMay. And um, Jennifer's here. And I would like to bring her up here and uh, do something with her. So Jennifer, would you give her the mic? Hello, beautiful. <laughs> Hi, sit down. How are you? Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, everybody. It's a different view up here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this is... Uh, it's my new hair. It is. It's like we look alike. We don't look... Yeah, yes, I, I don't know. want to scare everyone. No, no. We would look alike. You wouldn't scare like you're so beautiful because you're not this body, for sure. Yeah. So um, you went to John of God? Yes. Tell us about that. Yeah, it was um, something I went into, obviously, with an open mind and... Of course, when you're at a desperate place, you'll try anything. So going down there was overall a very peaceful experience, and it's really hard to describe what it's like there. Um, it's such a feeling thing. It's not mm. something you can really intellectualize or even explain very well. You had the spiritual but surgery? I had the first time I was in line with him, he sent me to get herbs. Mm -hmm. The next two times, I did have two spiritual surgeries. Mm. Yeah. And did you have to rest after that? Oh, yeah. And you, I felt the same as you. How can you? I sleep well? But it was good. Right. It was really good. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. what, and when, when was it that you went? Um, just this early part of the summer, Memorial mm -hmm. Day weekend through like maybe the second week of June. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what you, were, what you were dealing with with the esophageal cancer was, mm -hmm. was cleared up? Yep. It's all clear here. The only thing I know of now is there's two little tiny spots in my lung, like mm -hmm. a centimeter each. And that was according to the scan after I came back from Brazil. Mm -hmm. So in some ways I felt disappointed knowing, oh, shoot, it's still there, I wanted to have this miraculous healing, and I keep trying to remind myself maybe my timeline isn't, there isn't this, it doesn't happen instantly perhaps, mm -hmm. maybe the healing is continuing to happen, I'm hoping it is. Right. Um, so this mm -hmm. is where you are now, so you're facing these things. Now, yeah. I brought the, uh, the I Am Discourses with me, and I want to do it with you because okay. um, I just spent um, uh, a couple of weeks with Anita Morjani. Mm -hmm. Have you read her book? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, many of the questions she gets asked over and over again is, why is it that you came back? Mm -hmm. And so many people who at this terminal stage, in fact, no one has ever been at the stage of cancer that she was at and ever returned to take a breath, let alone to walk around and go to the world and write a book and, and talk. It's never happened before. That's why it was so important for me to write this because, and what, do you remember what her lesson was, what she, um, what the main thing that she learned in this near-death state? My takeaway from her writing was that it was just being her authentic self. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that authentic self has nothing to do with this body that we're in mm -hmm. or the possessions that we have or what the, what the medical records say, or whatever. It's like to treasure your magnificence, to treasure the, the perfection that you are, and that is infinite. Mm -hmm. And that uh, when she's asked the question, why did you come back and my mother didn't, or my sister didn't, or whatever, she said, um, they are the lucky ones. She said, the place that I was in, getting back into my body was the absolute last thing that I really wanted to do. I just had a knowing that my father had given, her father who had passed away ten years before was there telling her, you have to go back. Now, the reason I say Anita's uh, book is so important, it's not because she had such a great story, it's because it's such a, she's a walking, talking, living, breathing piece of evidence about the miraculousness of, of all of this. And all she said to come back was to say, is what you just said, mm -hmm. is to be your authentic self. But in the I Am Discourses, and I brought three sections that I want to read to you, mm -hmm. and then I would like to do a short group meditation for Jen, Jennifer, is it? Sure. 
Jennifer. Jen, Jennifer. Okay. Uh, I'd like to do, would you mind? We could all do maybe five minutes of, uh, and there are some, I know there's some great healing people in here as well. Uh, so I'd like to send the, all of that energy to Jen as well. Um, so these are the things that I was doing this morning at five o'clock this morning, thinking about you. <clears throat> Stand in the room by yourself and declare, I am master of my world. I am the victorious, intelligence governing it. I send forth into my world this mighty, radiant, intelligent energy of God. I command it to create all perfection, to draw me to me the opulence of God made visible in my hands and use. I am no longer the babe of Christ, but the master presence grown to full stature, and I speak and command with authority. You are not asking, you are not begging, you are commanding the highest intelligence that you are to go to work for you. Okay? I want so much, this is Saint Germain speaking, I want so much to have you feel that you are the only authority in this world or any other so far as your world is concerned. Do not ever fear that the perfection of your world is going to disfigure anyone else's world so long as your intent is not to harm anyone. It does not matter what the world about you says or how much they try to intrude upon you, their doubts, their fears, their limitations. You are the supreme authority in your world and all you have to do is to say, when you are beset by these conditions, I am the mighty magic circle of protection about me that is invincible and repels from me every discordant thought and element which seeks to find entrance or intrude itself. I am the perfection of my world and it is self-sustained. The words I am, that's such powerful words. I mean, I've underlined them, I've studied them, I've memorized them, I've put them into practice. This I am presence and the word fear is in there. According to Anita, what she came to understand is that her cancer was the result of fear. Even though you have been a health practitioner and all of the things, we are, we are besieged by fear aren't we? I mean, we hear it every single day. Cancer is just one of them. But almost every message that comes at us through the media, and maybe that's why I have so much uh, disdain for all of that noise, because so much of the noise that comes at us is in this area of fear, and none of it says what is said here. You have the capacity to command that this I am presence that you are work with you. You don't have to be, you don't have to be uh, begging, you don't have to be sad, you don't have to be, feel inferior to it. You make this declaration, I am. I am, I love this. I am the master of my world. I am the victorious intelligence governing it. I send forth into my world this mighty, radiant, intelligent energy of God. I command it to create all perfection. Okay, that's one. The second one is on fear. When I say I am the governing presence, I am fully consciously aware that I have set in motion the full power and intelligence of God producing the desired conditions and that they are thus self-sustained. He says, it seems to me that it has not been clearly understood that when you use the expression, I am the presence in my mind, my home, and my world, you are not only commanding the conquering presence of this activity through your own consciousness, but you are calling forth the assistance of the I am or God presence into your home, your world, or whomever contacts it. Therefore, when you say, I am the conquering presence, I command this, 
I am presence to govern perfectly my mind, my home, my affairs, and my world. You have sent forth the greatest decree possible to be given, and you have but to feel the sustaining power of this in the face of every appearance until you find perfection manifest in your mind, your home, and your world. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. Mm -hmm. So this is about casting out fear. Now, I didn't know how to cast out fear because I didn't feel afraid. I had 30 minutes of denial, and then when I was told, I have cancer. And 30 minutes later, I was walking, on, and I met this woman, Pam McDonald, many of you have heard me talk about, who has written a book, a Hay House book, called The Perfect Gene Diet. And um, she was sent to, to my home. I went for a walk. Instead of turning right, I turned left, and there she was sitting on the front lawn of the, of the, uh, at Kanapali Beach, and I, she started to ask me if I could do some work with her and help her with, with her practice and so on, and I said, I've just been diagnosed with leukemia. I said, I just, this is not the moment for that, and she said, now I know why I was sent here, because she was sent there. And when she was, I changed around the way I began to eat. That, 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 very, that was the day. It was the, that afternoon. I was on a, on a whole new approach to... You, you, you just have to know that there's something operating here. Um, and you're being up here and sitting here today. And none of this is to say that you're going to live to be 102. None of us to say that. Uh, that because who you are is infinite already. And when you stop identifying yourself with this body that it is in and just command this I am presence to work with you in living a fully functioning, glorious life for you and your son, then you, it begins to take effect. Now, I have one more quote. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> You must take the unconditional stand with your body. That, and this is to everyone in the room, this is the unconditional stand according to <clears throat> Saint Germain that you must take with your body. That the I am presence governs this physical body completely and compels it into obedience. The more attention you give your body, the more it is the master and the more it will demand and keep demanding from you. When the physical body is either chronically ill or continually showing disturbance, it proves that it has been given attention over a period of years to one disturbance or another, and it will never until you take the positive attitude and whip it into obedience. You can positively produce whatever you want in your body if you will fix your attention upon the perfection of it, but not let your attention rest on its imperfections. You do not want to be thinking about cancer. I rarely do. In fact, the only time I ever talk about leukemia is when I'm talking to people about how not to talk about what's wrong with your body and use it as an example. Otherwise, I don't go through life saying I have leukemia and I talk about it. And the only thing I ever say is I have a diagnosis of leukemia. Let me, I've got to say this to you again. You can, this is to everyone in this room. If you focus on the imperfection of something, you attract more of it into your life. We become what we think about. It's just such a simple thing. You can positively produce whatever you want in your body if you will fix your attention upon the perfection of it, but not let your attention rest on its imperfection. For the ascension, I am the commanding presence Use this often. These are your words. These are from channeled words from St. Germain. I am the commanding presence. Use this often, for it stills the outer activity of you uh, so you can become centered in the activity of love. The instant you feel something discordant, turn away from it. You have the scepter of power in your consciousness. Now use it. You are to follow Jesus' command. See no man after the flesh. It means exactly what it says. Recognize no human imperfection in thought, feeling, word, or deed. A very powerful thing to use in problems is to take the simple consciousness, God in me, the I am presence, come forth, govern, and solve this situation harmoniously. 
it would do wonders. The whole thing is to instantly draw forth the I am presence and set it to work. Say to your divine self, see here God, come forth and take care of this. God wants you to set him to work. This releases a flood of the God energy, intelligence, and substance which flows forth to do the command. We are not very often raised to believe that we make a command to God. But all you're doing is commanding the God that you are and connecting to it and making that. Does that make sense to you? Yes. I believe that I'm healed and I believe that I'm currently healing. And I really do try to take that piece of the word cancer. I don't want to identify with it at all. I don't want to be known as a cancer patient or survivor or any of it because I don't... I don't even understand why this darn thing showed up. Mm. I certainly don't want to own it. It's a gift. Sometimes I want the gift receipt to return it, though. <laughs> I didn't want this gift. I'm always up for a good challenge, but this is a little, it's a gift. A little too much. You, you, yeah. you, you must see it as a gift. I could never have gone out on my 71st and then my 72nd birthday and given away so much of what I used to hoard, not hoard, but hold for my family and for whatever, and just give it away with no ex I could never have done that had I not had this diagnosis and had the experience with John of God. So what, what have you, what positive thing has come out of this cancer for you? There are a lot of things. What are they? You have such a beautiful smile. <laughs> And a 10-year-old boy as well. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty great too. Uh, some of the positive things um, for sure is being in the moment and really connecting with what I remember you saying many times is we're spiritual beings having a human experience. And that to me brings me a lot of comfort, knowing that I'm not just this body, I'm not just this label. I have a lot of things to me that aren't about cancer that I still have to offer the world. Another thing that's been positive is just really being able to let go of fear of if I can get through this kind of biggest scary thing of my life, I'm not afraid of speaking my truth or cleaning up any old business with someone, an old friend that we've had a cut off or being bold and, mm -hmm. and saying what I don't want to be thinking of dying on my deathbed of having the music still in me. Mm -hmm. And so being bold to say what I, needs to be said now and having a deeper relationship with my sister and my family and just What about really, your son? Oh yeah, my, my son is pretty intuitive and he's like, Mom, you're going to get better. I'm not worried about it. Mm. But for sure, I'm doing a lot of legacy work, you know, as, as the, if I'm not going to live the long life that I, we would all hope You're going to live an I infinite wish. life. You're, all, you're already eternal. Yeah. You, you're, you are infinite. I guess there's a piece of fear in me as, as a mom, if I'm not here for this little boy, what legacy work will I leave You will mind? be here for your little boy, wherever you are. You will be. There's yeah. no place for you to go. There's no place to go. That's when yeah. Muktananda was dying and all of his devotees around him. Please, yeah. Swami, please don't leave. Please. He looked up and said, don't be silly. Where could I go? <laughs> There's nowhere to go. Yeah. So you've really identified some really powerful things. When you look at your little boy, do you see him different now than you did before? In some ways, mm. yeah. I know, I know he'll survive. Whatever the outcome is for me, I know he'll, mm. he'll go on and he will have a good life and there'll be people that will support him and teach him about what, my, what empowered me, what inspired me, so he'll know his mom mm. even if I'm not here with him physically. Are there um, any people in your life that you've had antagonisms towards or revenge towards or hurts towards that you've cleaned up? Mm -hmm. Since that, who mm -hmm. tell us? Go closer um, with the mic. Oh, I think of like old relationships that were kind of cut off, or people I haven't talked to in a decade that I feel like there's something in there that was unresolved that I need to say to them. So I did that. With You've them. done all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's and really freeing. It's really empowering. See how all yeah. incredible gifts that you've mm -hmm. been given. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask everyone in the room. To, we're going to do an om, just an om, and I will read this while you do it, over and over, for Jennifer, and for anyone else. Okay. 
So take a deep breath. Let it out. Again. in me, the I Am Presence, come forth, govern and resolve this situation harmoniously, come forth and take care of this, I am the Commanding Presence. forth and take care of this. I command it. God in me, keep it going. The I Am Presence come forth. Govern and solve this situation harmoniously. Feel your Jennifer, let it go right into your soul. and no outer activity that I need to know can be withheld from me because I am the wisdom I am the perception I am the revealing power bringing everything before me that I may see and understand and be able to act accordingly. Now if we'll just do it in silence, just silence. And everybody do it internally for a minute. presence within you governs every aspect of your life. Stay in harmony with that I Am Presence. Pay no attention to anything that is discordant. I am well. I am perfect health. I am healed. I am God. Thank you. God bless you, dear. Love you too. You can stay up here or not. Okay. We'll take the last 15 or 20 minutes. You can stay here if you like. It's a nice place. 
I'm going to read the same poem that I read the other day from Gifts, of, uh, Gifts with No Giver by Nirmala. And then I'd like to have the microphone open and anybody who would like to walk up to it, I'd like you to just, uh, just share a satsang. The, um, the thoughts that come to you. Not a Q&A. I always thought you would come to me in the shape of a beautiful lover. I never dreamed you would steal my heart with no shape at all. I always pretended I needed arms to hold me and lips to kiss away my pain. Yet I find fulfillment in the embrace of empty space. I always wished you would speak to me with words of tender sweetness. Now I know you whisper silently of your undying love. I always knew I would find you, although I foolishly looked with my eyes. You were here all along, hiding just out of sight in my heart. Would you come up? Sony is here with um, us on the tour and she does uh, Kiritan music. She's going to sing something very softly. If anyone would like to come to the mic, I'll give her the mic. Yeah, she's coming right there. Why don't you tell us what you're going to do and, and then we'll have people speak. Just take a minute or two. Namaste, everybody. Namaste is the God in me, salutes the God in you. With your permission, I would like to do Namaskar to Dr. Vendir. We do Namaskar to cut down our ego. I bow down to you. Sorry. We do this to cut down our ego, like Mahatma Gandhi says, when you stand low, you have no fear of falling. So, I would like to stay low. And today I'll share with you a bhajan that is normally sang for the Lord or to the Guru. Guru is the spiritual master that guides you. Today, I consider Dr. Ben Dyer as a guru who's guiding us all to experience this light, this blessing that we're all seeking for. Can I sit down and do yes. it? Yeah. I'm doing it in Hindi, but I would like you all to know the meaning of it as I say so. Hence, I'll read it out to you first and say the meaning of it so that when I sing it, you all can feel it. You all can feel every word of what it means. It says, Har Saas Mary. Puja Tumari, every breath that I take is a prayer to you. Halpar Mera Prasad Hitera, every second of my life is an offering for you. Harkadam Mera Pradakshin Tera, every step that I take brings me closer to you. Harvachan Mera Jai Jai Tumara. Every word that I utter is of your glory. Har pushpapar sugan hetera. Every leaf that I see brings me your fragrance. Har deen deenam sursat hotera. Every sound that I hear is but your melody. Surya satis chandrama samokra. Ye Vishal Netra Samandar Sekera. You are as powerful as the sun, yet as sweet as the moon, and deeper than the ocean. 
तेरे ही चरणों में ये सवेरा हर एक सवेरा हर एक सवेरा आई बो डाउन टू एंड ऑफ दिस डे एंड ऑल माई डेज ऑल माई डेज शेल सिंग आउट टू यू इन ट्यून एंड आई होप यू कैन फील द वाइब्रेशन ऑफ दिस सॉन्ग सास मेरी जा तुम्हारी हर पल मेरा प्रसाद हो तेरा प्रसाद है तेरा हर सास मेरी तुम्हारी हर पल मेरा प्रसाद है तेरा प्रसाद है तेरा हर कदम मेरा प्रदक्षिण तेरा हर कदम मेरा प्रदक्षिण तेरा प्रदक्षिण तेरा हर कदम मेरा प्रदक्षिण तेरा हर वचन मेरा जय जय तुम चन मेरा जय जय तुम्हारा हर पुष्प पर सुगंध है तेरी हर दीन दीनम सुरसाद हो तेरा सुरसाद हो तेरा हर सास मेरी पूजा तुम्हारी हर पल मेरा प्रसाद हो तेरा प्रसाद हो तेरा सूर्य सा तेज चंद्रमा सा मुखर ये विशाल नेत्र समंदर से गहरा सूर्य सा तेज चंद्रमा सा मुखरा ये विशाल नेत्र समंदर से गहरा तेरे
Just hearing the sound. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's what the sounds of satsang are like. <laughs> okay, to some people, I'd like you to just just take a, just remember to be brief and just to make a few. We only have a few moments left. Go ahead. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. My name is Eleni, and I'm from Sydney. And I would very quickly mm-hmm. like to be at service and share some wisdom. What is divine revelation? Revelation means a manifestation, a revealing of what is hidden and unknown. Divine revelation is a showing forth. It is God revealing himself to man. When we are in the presence of divine revelation, we witness a voice within our soul. We feel God's presence. When we gaze at the stars in the sky, we we comprehend the divine wisdom and majestic of God. Our God is a loving and giving God, showering us with all the abundance of the earth along with his divine acts. God says to man, here I am, here I am. O man, I care for you, I provide for you. Pay attention and study a bit that which you enjoy Ponder a little, and you will discover me. This is the reason, St. Paul says, that the spiritual essence is within us, written in our hearts. When I first had read what God had said, I realized that we must go within and turn inwards and listen to the voice within our heart. Then we would understand who God is, recognizing him. Understanding that you are connected and can ascend with your thought to the knowledge of the one true God. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you. That's very beautiful. I, uh, my name is Dwayne, and I'll make this quick and brief. Um, five years ago, and it's all your fault, fault Wayne, um, I, uh, I read about 12... Uh, for 12 years, your information, and you said not to believe a word of it, and I didn't. And I'm here today, and it's changed my life, so thank you. Uh, what I wanted to share was um, I was in a room with 86 men, and uh, in the center of the room was a basket full of uh, red silk. And they said, we want you to all hold hands. We want you to think about the pain and the suffering that you may have experienced in your life if you've ever hurt yourself uh, maybe tied, uh, you know, if you've hurt your knee, tie it around your knee. If you've had a broken heart, pin it onto your heart. And, uh, you know, anywhere you've experienced pain, physical, emotional, spiritual, and whatnot. So, uh, of course, at this point, I was all into me and imagining that there's nobody in this room that experienced near as much pain and suffering as myself. Um, so about 15 minutes go by, and we're all doing this thing, and we stop. And I look around and I see that every single man in this room from head to toe is covered in red. And I realized for the first time in my life that I don't suffer alone. And I think this message that I wanted to give was that five years ago I started focusing on contrast. And, and is there anybody in this planet, in this world, that has not experienced contrast? And I couldn't come up with one. And I realized that in the contrast is the greatest gift for us. It's our greatest lesson. It's our greatest opportunity to learn and grow. And then I said, wait a minute. What about Jesus? Maybe this great teacher never experienced contrast. And then the story of Gethsemane came to me. And I said, he was sweating blood. He was resisting so tremendously what he was called to do. And he said, God, take this cup. And nothing happened. And then, as the story goes, finally, he said, Thy will, not mine. If you won't take this cup, I'll drink it. And I realized that in the contrast to grow...
surrender. And I feel like that message was to be delivered today to Jennifer because something within her, some contrast in her life wants to serve her. And I believe, as it was for me, that we must surrender to it. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you. Hi. Um, you asked me to share a story in the dining room the other night, Wayne, about yes. the perfect gene diet. Right. So just to give a little bit of background first, I guess, um, briefly, my father was also my greatest teacher. Um, my name is Jay Chopra, born in Ireland in the 70s, which was an unusual thing to be half Indian and half Irish. Mm. Um, he, also, he was very similar to your father mm. and left me, when I was, left me and my mother when I was about four. And we, right. nev we never reunited mm -hmm. um, before he died as well. I haven't made it back to the final resting place uh, which is the Ganges, mm. so that's certainly on my bucket list. But I guess um, part of my fear and anger that I've had to work through and replace with love, um, I was like 240, 250 pounds mm. in weight, which is about 18 stones, roughly, mm -hmm. for people who understand stones. Mm -hmm. And um, that was just in the last four or five years, and I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And I had corrected a lot of my my mind or I, myself, my partner and I, Teresa, were lucky enough to be on the Caribbean cruise and where Pam MacDonald was speaking, who you mm -hmm. spoke about earlier. And, you know, a completely synchronistic event and got to meet, meet Pam. And then I was actually living in Manhattan last year, so I was able to access Pam a bit easier. So I got my, my perfect gene diet d typing done for anybody in the room mm -hmm. who's suffering from any disease. I know you did it yourself as well. I do. Mm. Uh, and, and do. Mm. Um, and I was, I, I was on two grams of metformin a day, um, which is for type 2 diabetes, and also on um, lisinopril, which is for high blood pressure. And I was within um, 12 months of being on the perfect gene diet. I can, I'm on no medication, and I am now, in total in the last few years, I'm 80, 70, 80 pounds lighter than I was. So I just want to, for any, I suppose I'm sharing it, not for me really, but to say to anybody in the room, um, you know, if you're suffering from any disease process, there was a lot of it correcting my mind and, you know, being exposed to the biology of belief with Bruce Lipton as well. Mm. But just to say thank you to you and Pam as well, but to anybody in the room, I would highly recommend looking Pam up. I think it's the perfectgenediet.com. Perf perfectgenediet.com, yes. Yeah. So I just, I just wanted to share it. And one last comment was I saw you in Toronto after you had given all that money away. Mm and elevated would be an understatement. I, I think I had seen you a lot of times, mm. but on that particular day in Toronto, after you had turned 70, I think. Um, 71. 71, mm -hmm. you were certainly, I, the word I would use is, is floating. But, I know, But yeah. um, thank, thank you for everything and namaste, yeah. namaste. Thank you so much. I still can't believe you're, you're Indian and speaking Irish, but that's... Uh, <laughs> the interesting thing about the giving away process has been that um, since I've been doing that in, in such large numbers and, uh, and, and also in, uh, in here, in my heart, in such a large way, um, more and more and more has just showed up and showed up and showed up and showed up. It's like uh, you, once you stop the flow, once you get the flow going, it just flows through you and you don't, you don't even want to have it stay with you even, you know, so you want to just keep it going, keep it circulating. Okay, we won't put any more on that because we have to stop in about five minutes. But you can, whoever's standing there, we can keep it short. Yes. Hi, I'm Lydia Christie, and this Hi, is Lydia. my first time meeting you and coming to one of your events. Mm. I learned about you in a strange way on a vehicle going to uh, North Carolina to a spiritual mountain. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine had your uh, CD that was given to her two years prior, and she just never opened it. And she thought, well, we're going to the spiritual mountain. Let's uh, listen to this guy and see what he has to say. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it's been changing my life mm -hmm. ever since. But um, I was over uh, getting a body massage, and um, they had the beautiful music playing, and all of a sudden came uh, Frank Sinatra's uh, Fly Me to the Moon. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I'm laying there, flat down, face and that little whole thing, and um, I said to, the, to Jay and the masseuse, I said, uh, wow, I like that song. It's really a, one of my favorite songs. And as I was getting ready to sing the song, Fly Me to the Moon, poof, 
like you said, it's gonna hit ya. Mm. And I realize it's me, fly me to the moon. Mm. And all this time I'm like looking to my husband to fly me to the moon. Mm. And I'm throwing expectations at him that he doesn't know about. And then when I'm not getting them back, I get angry at him. And right there and then I just realized I have a lot to say to him when I get home. Mm, good, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, am, I am going to fly to the moon. Mm. And thank you. You're very welcome. Mm. Fly me to the moon and let me sing among the stars. Let me see what June is like on Jupiter and Mars. In other words, please be true. Anyway, that's, yeah, great. Uh, they sang that, by the way, for Neil Armstrong um, as he passed away just a few weeks ago. They, they were playing that, Fly Me to the Moon. And he used to say, I get so tired of people playing that song everywhere <laughs> for the last, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, and, a, and a big part of this uh, spiritual journey is really having an awareness that, um, you know, uh, that real un divine love is a love that says, I wrote it, if it's, uh, it's on page 222 of uh, There's a Spiritual Solution to Every Problem. Uh, and it's uh, that, that, that love without attachment is the kind of love that says, I love you no matter what it is that you choose to do, no matter where you choose to be, whatever kind of choices you make in your life, regardless of what you want and whatever, I have no expectations for you. I just love you for what you are. We love the things we love for what they are. That is like the freest way to ever have to have love. And it's that whole thing I said earlier about don't fence me in. You don't get fenced in then. You don't have to be. Yes. Hi, Dr. Dyer. I'm Hi. Marcia from Hi, Florida. Marcia. And I was on your Miracles tour last year. Mm. And uh, this for me is the continuation of the miracle right. because I'm just one of these people that gets really angry and says well it's not working for me mm. and um, there's just so much I want to say but I want to encapsulate it as uh, in a little capsule here um, I've been very angry all my life and uh, about 24 years ago Lyme disease became very popular in Connecticut mm. and it's increased and when right. I say popular I mean right. you know, prevalent mm -hmm. and I said uh, I'm not going to buy into that um, but I got it I, I got bit twice by a tick mm -hmm. and now I have chronic Lyme disease so you know and, and I read your first book back in the early 80s your erroneous zones mm. and so I, you've been with me ever since then and mm. I've always admired what you've had to say so um, I guess what I'm trying to share today is, is it's been a long journey of anger and uh, why me and this doesn't work for me but I'm gonna keep trying somehow and someday somehow I'll have a shift mm -hmm. and uh, I'm still waiting but I think that this trip and especially today right now is mm -hmm. um, the shift is happening so let me help you with this right now say the I am presence within you I am, all right. I am presence so this I am presence within, within you me. you command it I and, and as you command it you say I am, I am perfect health perfect health mm -hmm. I am well I am well I am healed I am healed I am God I am God there's no such thing as Lyme disease there's no such thing as Lyme disease mm -hmm. I am well I am five minutes before you go to sleep every single night you want to not program your subconscious mind with, I have Lyme disease. You want to program it with, I am well. He calls those things which do not exist as though they did. You must be able to say that and not look at what the doctors say, what the medical records say, mm -hmm. what your history says. All of that is irrelevant. Right. I am perfect health. And as you do, when you go to sleep at night, and I'll be talking about this in the, second, in the last talk here, is that you just go into the uh, into the Bible and look, and when he, you know, when you are sleeping in your bed, in your slumber, he will then open your ears and seal your instructions for eight hours in your subconscious mind. You want to marinate in "I am well," not "I have Lyme disease" or "I'm waiting," as you said. There's nothing to wait for. I am perfect health. Okay. The, the line I want to leave you with is the line I close so many of my talks with. It's again from The Course in Miracles. In every moment of your life, you have this choice. You can either be a host to God, 
or a hostage to your ego. It's your call. Thanks for a great day. Thank you. Thanks. God bless you. Namaste. See you tomorrow in Ephesus. Welcome.